we're super excited for our fireside chat coming up now. Um, our topic is disinformation's defining moment. And here on the stage, we have Jordan Yearman, who is the senior copywriter at CloudFest, and Elliot Higgins, who is the founder at Bellingcat. Welcome to the stage, gentlemen. So welcome, Elliot. I know we had a chance to talk earlier today, but uh, if you could for just a moment give our esteemed audience here just like the elevator pitch for what you do and what Bellingcat does. Um, so Bellingcat is a organization that does something called open source investigation, and that's based on using publicly available material to investigate a range of different topics, and that's included everything from the shooting down of Malaysian Airlines flight MH17, chemical weapons attacks in Syria, the poisoning of Alexei Navalny, um, but also smaller stuff. Um, for example, I've investigated the kidnapping of dogs using this same, same sort of stuff. So it can be a very right, wide range of topics. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that's come up in, in researching your work and the conversations that we've had is that we collectively seem to have lost our bullshit detector. And I was wondering how we go about getting that back. It's, it's tricky because um, I, I think often when you've got policymakers looking at this issue in particular, they see it as a problem of outside forces, usually Russia, kind of having an impact on our society, lying to us, spreading disinformation. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it's a part of a really big social shift that's happened over the last 15 years in the way we communicate with each other, how we access information, and how we engage with in information. It's no longer the old gatekeeps top-down model that's really dominated for decades. It's now more, turning into more of a peer-to-peer -peer model. Mm -hmm. We are not just a receiver of information, but a participant in the creation of information. And understanding that is really crucial to looking at how we actually address the issues that have emerged from it. Indeed, and it's like these dopamine hits are part of the business model for how news is uh, broadcast isn't even the right word anymore. Um, but how it's shared and what we get from sharing news with each other, uh, it's almost like an addiction. And the way platforms have changed have both uh, met that need and also helped to drive that need. So I'm wondering how you and your team sees the evolution of social media platforms impacting the types of disinformation that we see and how we engage with that and how we sometimes unwittingly and indeed sometimes willingly spread it? I think a lot of it comes down to a real erosion of trust in traditional sources of authority, the media, the governments, uh, medical professionals in some cases, um, and how people, when they feel that they've been betrayed or let down by those sources of authority, can now find groups online who agree with them. Mm -hmm. And those groups create a bubble which reinforce those ideas and that can draw them towards more conspiratorial ways of thinking. And they don't think, oh, I'm going to believe in conspiracy theories or spread disinformation. They see themselves as truth seekers. Mm -hmm. But often they've got to the point where they really have such a deep distrust in, say, the American government, for example. Mm -hmm. They always take the opposite side to whatever they imagine that source of authority believes in. Um, and then you end up with basically lots of sub-communities growing around things, you know, like we've investigated, chemical weapons attack, MH17, all these things where they're saying, no, this is all lies because the West is saying it and the West is bad, therefore the opposite must be true. Right. And then exactly as we were talking about earlier, uh, the more you try to enforce the actual truth, the less someone who's resistant to those ideas is going to become. It makes people dig their heels in even more. Like, oh, vaccines are safe. Oh, well, that's what Bill Gates wants us to think kind of thing. And no matter what you do, you're, it's like you're speaking the wrong language. And I'm, I personally have no idea how to overcome that. I think one thing we need to understand is how information connects to each other nowadays. Mm -hmm. If we have, take the approach that's been taken by a lot of governments in terms of disinformation, which is setting up lots of fact-checking websites, that really doesn't have much of an effect because you need communities who are engaged with that information to share and propagate it. And if that doesn't exist, it just sits on a website that no one bothers looking at. The other, thing, the other approach has been that there's an education-led approach. 
But my concern with that is whilst it's good to teach young people media literacy, mm -hmm. it, again, doesn't understand how the way they communicate, how they use information has changed so significantly. And I think a really big part of addressing this issue has to be not only teaching them media literacy, but also engaging them with issues that they can actually have an impact on. Because if you have a community that's splintering into lots of different bubbles focused on specific topics, the truth just becomes another bubble. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter unless there's accountability that comes from that discovery of the truth. Um, and as we're doing more work in education and working with students, we're trying to build that model out, that it's not just about teaching people how to find the facts and establish the truth, it's then what do you do with that truth? Mm -hmm. And the way that we engage as communities or families or even as strangers on the internet has changed with the platformization and algorithmization of these platforms. It becomes like my Facebook, your Facebook, you know, your racist uncle's Facebook are going to be these very different uh, mazes of funhouse mirrors that you go through with algorithms kind of showing you what it thinks you want to see. And it's very easy to then have that warp one, one's view of reality. And so there's an education component to it, as you said, and I agree with that, that there's not much you can do in terms of like fact checking, fact checking, fact checking, but what on the technology side can we do to facilitate uh, making truth easier to discern online? Well, I think the big concern a lot of people have at the moment is AI generated imagery, and that's mm -hmm. certainly becoming more and more of an issue. Um, it's become easier to make not only photographs, but we now have OpenAI's new video creation software, which is very powerful. Mm -hmm. We've seen already with the US elections attempts to um, have robocalls with Joe Biden speaking, where it's an AI generated voice. Uh, we've seen fake AI imagery of Donald Trump hugging Dr. Fauci being put <laughs> out by the Ron DeSantis cam campaign. And we've seen AI generated imagery being used in other elections elsewhere. So mm -hmm. there is a threat there. The approach of hoping that it will get fact checked at some point and then fixed even if it's through something like community notes on Twitter, I don't think it's very effective. Because by the time an image like that has been spread, it has been propagated, millions of people could have seen it, and by the point that it's got to that, no fact check in the world is really gonna make much of a difference. So I think there needs to be more pressure on social media companies and AI companies to develop a way to detect this stuff as it's being posted and to label it as it's being posted mm -hmm. so that people will think twice. Because the way people use social media is not to carefully examine every picture they're seeing. They see something, they decide whether or not they're going to look at it for more than half a second. Mm -hmm. And if they do, then they make a very quick decision about resharing it or commenting. And these dynamics are actually really, really poisonous when it comes to having just a shared sense of reality that you can find, follow people who just reinforces your emotional um, state, your anxieties, just by sharing stuff that feeds into that, it doesn't need to be fact-checked or verified because, mm -hmm. in a sense, that's not what you're there for. You're there to be reassured. Yeah, yeah. And as countries like Canada have, uh, you know, kind of put, uh, you know, Facebook as, uh, and the news have kind of gone into the friend zone in countries like Canada where uh, news outlets are not posting on Facebook. Well, there are lots of other platforms that are very happy to fill that void. And when you're seeing something in a social media platform that's all designed and laid out in the same way, it becomes really hard to know if you're looking at something that's from a legitimate source or not. Because like a CNN article uh, and a Rebel News article will, will look the same in the viewer. And so I'm personally quite concerned about what that's gonna do to an audience who, you know, funny enough, 25 years ago, no one wanted to put their credit card into a browser, and now people will just believe like almost anything they see, you know? And it's not just political stuff. I actually brought this cue card because there's this really full-on headline that I saw on Bellingcat that I wanted to share. It's a lot. No, parting, no part of this headline would even have made sense 10 years ago. Any dream. Secretive AI platform broke Stripe rules to rake in money from non-consensual pornographic deepfakes. Now, first of all, that's some scary shit. Second, it suggests like a greater responsibility to understand how black box technology works and the implications that that could have. 
you know, when we think about AI, a lot of the talk has been about copyright, but in terms of how it can hurt someone on a very personal level is very, very scary, I think especially to people who have children. Yeah, we've um, done a lot of reporting recently on d these deep fake porn websites, um, and over the last couple of months, really, you've seen more reporting on this where um, young girls at school are being targeted by boys using these deep fake um, images. Uh, it, it's easy to do. All you need is one photograph. You can easily find these platforms, and you can use them to um, create any image you want of any woman, girl you like. And this, I think, is a really serious problem. I mean, this is something that I think we're seeing a bit of reporting on now. There was um, some images a while ago of Taylor Swift that kind of was spread on Twitter, and that was shut down quickly. But yeah. This is happening in schools now. Young boys are getting access to this technology and they're using it. And effectively, they're creating child pornography as part of the process as well. So it's not even just that act of, you know, really attacking a, a young girl and, you know, her freedom to even be online. Yeah. It's also about them being involved in very, very serious crimes mm -hmm. just because they now have very easy access to this technology. And it's something that we're seeing more and more, more websites that are set up allowing you to make deep fake pornography of anyone you want. Yeah, it's especially terrifying. Like for, for the non-Taylor Swift population of the world, which is most of us, like what do you do if you don't have the resources or the clout to get the attention of the platform or the creator to get this stuff taken down, and that's what's scary. As someone who is an artist, I work with AI as well, and I'm fascinated by the science and I'm fascinated by the technology, but I'm also like a little bit, you know, it is scary. Um, and talking about dis going back to the idea of disinformation and this being disinformation's defining moment, is it how do you see it in terms of not just the pivot point of disinformation creators? but those who want to defend against it or dispel it. I think we have to, you know, I'm, I'm part of this counter disinformation community. Um, and there is really now in the last six months, I would say a shift to recognizing that this problem isn't just one of fact checking. Mm -hmm. It's something that is a much more broader social issue and it needs that approach. It can't just be that we, you know, give a fact, fact check to an article or, or we teach kids how to tell if a fake line's dodge, a headline's dodgy or not, we've got to show them how to investigate. We've got to equip them with those skills and we've got to connect them together mm -hmm. because they already are connected. That's how they communicate. That's how they yeah. consume information. So we need to support that, not say, oh, you can't have TikTok, you can't have this platform. There is this kind of movement in certain regions of the world where you know, they really want to shut down these social media platforms and stop children having access to them. But this is also how, this is, would be like taking newspapers and television away from older generations. It's yeah. how they communicate. It's where they exist. It's their media environment. Mm -hmm. And when they see it's being shut down, that's something that is a threat to how they consume information. So I think rather than trying to legislate our way out of this, we need more effort put into education. Yeah. It's like the last thing a fish will discover is water. You know, uh, banning a platform will simply just, you know, bring about another one without solving the root problem, which, as you said, you know, groups t tend to radicalize each other, and we as a society seem perfectly happy to radicalize ourselves. And I think the trick is to find a way to break that cycle. Um, I had something else I wanted to ask you uh, tied into that about propaganda and populism and how our responsibility for that is, it was, okay, this is a quote from Gene Simmons from KISS, but I think it is appropriate here. As he said, Nosferatu cannot enter the maiden's chamber unbidden. And the idea that when we, uh, we invite some of this stuff in, because sometimes it feels good to be angry, or sometimes it feels good to be right. And I'm wondering where, where our responsibility lies in, uh, in breaking the cycle of, of believing this information and sharing it, or indeed willingly sharing misinformation? I, I think there is some online behaviors that you can have which um, c 
can help things, but the thing is, if you're telling people this and they're listening, that's not the audience you want to be reaching. It's the people who don't turn up to events like this, you don't really engage with this kind of thing because it's outside of the kind of media bubble they're consuming in. Mm -hmm. We also have to look at corporate responsibility about this, not just in terms of the big tech companies, mm -hmm. but for example, in the US, the way Fox News really broke down the barriers between conspiracy and mainstream news, mm -hmm. pursuing profit, yeah. it's as simple as that and how they use the culture wars in the US going over decades and decades to really build an audience that had a different version of reality presented to them. And then when we've seen, I think, the shift of the last, last eight years or so in particular, as we've seen the rise of kind of alt-right media in the US in particular, mm -hmm. um, this, this actually came up. We did research on COVID, looking at where a lot of COVID disinformation came from. Yeah. And there was a 24-hour cycle where you would have Donald Trump saying, doing his COVID briefing, say something insane, then the alt-right media would kind of launder it. They, they, they would be like, oh, he's just trying to trigger the libs, or, you know, actually, this is what he meant to say. And then that would be picked up by Newsmax, Fox News, and cleaned mm -hmm. up a little bit more, so their audience could be reassured that Donald Trump was actually really, really clever. And then, of course, that kind of went back into the ear of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a human centipede stitched up at both ends, just cycling around every <laughs> 24 hours. And it, it was just such a huge engine for disinformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a very simple cycle being repeated time and time again. It is, and, and the idea that uh, these news agencies can now put themselves at a distance from saying, oh, well, I didn't make up this bullshit. I just heard about it from someone else, and I'm just reporting it. And to me, that's as disgusting as the human centipede <laughs> analogy. <laughs> As someone who used to work at news, in news, this sort of thing just scares the crap out of me. Speaking of having the crap scared out of you, you showed me something backstage that was fascinating. And I do want to talk a little bit about that. Are you able to talk about that? Um, I can talk about it in broad terms. Yeah. In broad terms. So in terms of how realistic deep fakes can get and how that gets tested and what the boundaries are. Are you able to talk a little bit about that work? Yeah, so I, I think one of the biggest shifts I've seen in terms of AI-generated imagery in the last probably six weeks is um, OpenAI's new video platform, which can create basically photorealistic video footage um, that I think could be a real issue in the future. I mean, even now we have photo, you know, AI-generated images that confuse and, um, you know, impact people, but these videos really are re remarkable. If you look at earlier AI-generated videos, you can tell they're kind of generating from one frame to the next, but it's very clear with these videos, they've created a, an environment that this motion is happening through. It's not generated frame by frame, it's generated from that environment. So it creates very realistic looking images, movement, figures, um, scenery, and I, I really think that AI is developing so, so quickly that we're always being surprised by the next big leap. If you look at just over the last two years, how Mid Journey's developed from creating like fairly realistic imagery to stuff that is very, very hard to tell the difference of, you've got um, AI music generation that started to come a thing, which is something I use quite a bit just for my own entertainment, but that's made huge advances over the last year. So it, it's very easy to look at AI and in all its forms now and say that seems bad but yeah. it's only going to get more powerful and just surprise us all the time. And we need to be prepared for that. And I really don't think as a society we're prepared for the impact that AI-generated video and um, other imagery will have because I, I think it'll be interesting to see with the upcoming elections. We've got them in the US and the UK and elsewhere in the world. I think two billion people are going to vote. So we'll see what impact that has in the campaigns. I think the US election will be particularly interesting for that as well, because it feels like that line was already crossed very early on in the Republican primaries where this AI-generated uh, images were being used. So God oh, knows yeah. what's going to happen you know, in September or October. <sighs> Buckle up, folks. I'm watching, I'm watching that election cycle unfold with uh, a curiosity that is more than a little morbid. Uh, it really does concern me a great deal. And then you have AI versus AI. I saw this conversation uh, with some friends who were teachers talking about, well, catching our kids using AI to write papers. And then you can also use AI to grade papers, and it makes one wonder why anybody is there. I, I've actually used that with my own kids, because 
<laughs> Sometimes they're like, oh, I've got a homework to do and I've got to hand it in tomorrow. So just get ChatGPT to yeah. hurry things up. Like, they're quite young, so it's things like do a presentation on an animal you like, but you can even get the slides kind of described and put them together. Yeah. Like that. And then you have time to use the AI music generator, make like a dubstep jazz record little, or something. Yeah, a little song to go along with it. But what's kind of interesting about that is that on the potential side, well, we've talked a lot about the doom and gloom, but there's also the bit that AI is essentially becoming a new programming language, mm. the same way you would use, uh, I don't know, Ruby on Rails or, or whatever the more modern. This is obviously the audience that will know the more modern versions that people are using, but the prompt box becomes a development engine. It becomes a programming language. And the sooner we can all get our heads around that, at both a, a consumer level and a, a company level and a government level, I think the better we'll be at coming up with cogent solutions to some of these problems. Um, do you have any advice for this audience, the cloud computing infrastructure virtualization uh, hosting audience, for what their role is now, or what their role could be in solving some of these problems? I think it's first being aware of the problems. I think there's so many developments and so many things that are changing that you really have to be quite aware of what, how things can impact you. One thing we've seen recently is um, more attacks on businesses coming from, say, the alt-right media, for example, mm -hmm. that they get upset about some really specific small thing, and then it becomes the latest kind of scandal in their community that no one else cares about. But because of the way they act, they start targeting individual businesses. So right. you have to be kind of aware how these communities can really focus on organizations and businesses. And you're, you might feel you're quietly doing whatever you're doing. And then all of a sudden, you're on some horrible little right-wing blog, and you've got phone calls and harassment. I, I think it's just um, we really are in what I feel like is a kind of revolutionary time in terms of AI, but also in terms of disinformation and how that's becoming in certain parts of society, a key part of discourse, rather than a kind of symptom of something negative for them. It's something they can use as a weapon and a tool against people they don't like. Yeah. And so I guess as sort of as we get towards the closing, you mentioned your kids and their homework. Is there something that you're doing? or Because you have a very uh, unique perspective on this sort of thing, because this is your day job, is dealing with disinformation, research, and that sort of thing. How are you teaching your own kids about this and sort of preparing them or empowering them to be uh, at least not part of the problem, if not part of the solution? Well, I, I mean, they're 9 and 12, so there's only so much I can discuss. In right. Of, I, I can't tell them about war crimes and stuff like that yet. <laughs> but, um, I, I kind of show them the different tools and the platforms and how they're used. Um, my daughter is especially, she's at that age where most of her friends have smartphones, so they're connecting on social media. So um, I, I've spoken to her about you know, the dangers of sharing information, just even photos of yourself nowadays. I, it's, you know, avoiding the details, but... Um, it's really just making sure they're educated about this stuff, because it also surprised me a lot when I speak to young people we're working with in education programs mm -hmm. of, in a sense, because they are using a version of the internet where all the rough edges have been filed off, that it's simple to use. They don't have to think about things like file structures or anything like that. Right. But actually, they have much less of a technological understanding than we think they do. I, I think especially older generations, they think because a four-year-old can use a tablet that they can, you know, be, they're fully computer literate and they like, are literate for using social media. But, um, and that is actually a way of thinking that infects a lot of policymaker approaches to these issues. They think that young people are really tech literate when in fact they're not, not and to an extent even less than say, you know, older generations are because they don't have that kind of they haven't seen the dirty edges of computers and you know, having to figure out you know, how to program auto-exact bats and stuff like that with MS-DOS. That's, that's an interesting point. Like We always think of uh, older generations, the stereotype is you know, they have a VCR that the clock is blinking 12, and then we can somehow fix their computer if it gets like, ransomware. But the reality is that Gen X and older have grown up in like a Star Wars vision of the future where it was all these pieces roughly held together with wires and stuff like that. And this, our generation's kids are growing up in a Star Trek version of the future where everything is smooth, almost like a product. So similar to how we grew up knowing how to fix spark plugs in a car, they 
you know, you have to plug a USB thing into it to figure out what's wrong with your car. It's a completely different mm -hmm. thing. Uh, yeah. As we get towards the end of our time and people are getting ready to go party, uh, is there anything you want to leave us with? to sort of help prepare us for the next steps? Because we know the bad guys aren't sitting still. I've always said with my work, you know, my background is not a professional investigator. It's something I learned myself. And mm -hmm. many of our investigations involve our community and that people can become part of that. We have a Discord server at the moment. There's 27,000 members. We've just had a series of stories published on people getting involved on that Discord server, looking into an oil spill off the coast of Trinidad and Tobago. And what I really like seeing is when people come together as communities online and we create those spaces. So if anyone wants to, in this room wants to get involved, we have ways you can get involved. Just come to our Discord server, have a look around, see what people are doing, and uh, maybe you can get involved for yourself. It's crazy that we live in a time where uh, telling the truth is activism, yet I suppose here we are. Uh, I think we have time for a few questions if anyone has any. All right. Well, thank you so much, Elliot, for joining us. Oh, oh this, over this I'm sorry, I didn't see you, sir. No way, Jordan. Thank you. My name is Alex. Um, okay, so I can hear sir, here, hold up one sec. Hold up one sec. Oh. There you like, go. I thought we were good. So um, I, I couldn't hear you quite that great, but yeah, my biggest concern truly is like, okay, we've got elections coming up everywhere. Um, I'm born in America. I will never go back for reasons that should be obvious. Um, <laughs> um, do you have any practical advice of how we can do anything? It, it's, it's such a, such a cluster mess, right? I, I would like to be able to say here's some really easy advice for America, mm. but the problem is the problems America faces are so, so deeply ingrained that it's kind of fact-checking is, it, it just seems like it barely counts now because everyone, everyone's in their camps already. If you look at the exit polls from the Republican primaries, Donald Trump voters exist in a completely alternative version of reality. And when they become a significant part of the base of you know, one of the two political parties in America, I think that's, um, that's a much, much deeper issue. And I think I, I can't even see it in generations how we could solve that problem. Yeah, sorry, I guess it's a trick question in a way. <laughs> yeah. Thanks anyway, for trying. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, how can AI nowadays reshape information and rights of minorities according to what you are doing? Um, I, th I think we're still in a, a time when a lot of these ideas are evolving around AI. So, for example, in our work, we kind of mo mostly worry about the impact that it's having through fake imagery and disinformation. There aren't many tools that have been developed already um, to really help that kind of work. And it's, it's frustrating to me because I think there is so much effort developing, uh, focused on developing image generation um, or large language models that when we look at the work of, say, Bellingcat, when we're using open source information, there's not so much work being done there. There has been some interesting attempts to do things like automated tools for geolocation and stuff like that, but it, it's still, it's probably because there doesn't seem to be a lot of money in the work that we do, um, which is why we're a charity rather than a uh, for-profit business. So I think it's hard to justify putting all the AI money into something that's uh, not for profit. Another question here, Jordan. So, um, thank you for your input so far, Elliot. Um, when we look into the future with AI advancing and maybe um, you know the saying in German, die Gedanken sind frei, and with AI we can put these, so uh, thoughts are free, but I think Gedanken sind frei is also internationally acknowledged. Um, we can put many of these thoughts into real pictures, so then we don't have the pictures in our head, we, they are out there, so in the future, doesn't it all come down to, um, like the, the trustworthiness of the source, so something is true, like when Elliot says it's true. Um, so, so you're thinking in terms of um, metadata and files, do you mean? 
to show that an image is verified? Is that kind of what you were thinking about? Yeah. Um, I mean, there are already attempts to create, uh, I think Adobe's pe creating a piece of um, software that allow cameras and um, smartphones to actually embed that kind of stuff into the file format automatically, and they've gone quite far in that. There has been many, many attempts in the past to create these camera apps that allow you to create verified imagery, and the context of that was it was being produced by organizations who work in conflict zone who want that verified evidence. The problem was that no one installed them or used them. So I think this thing with Adobe is quite helpful in the fact that they're going to start in as a pre-installed piece of software on a camera to have that kind of thing built into it. Right. Um, but it's still a while yet, and I think ultimately we still need to really force social media companies to have AI detection as part of the pro posting process. Yeah. I'm afraid we are out of time. We have a couple more people who wanted questions, but we are just way past time. We have to cut it off here. But everyone, thank you very much, Elliot and Jordan. Thank you.